Exactly. Well, I think that's a part of it, you know, as we dive deeper into this, especially even with this topic, you know, we have been talking about food sovereignty. We've been talking about um, just many things in the realm of food, gardening, and to that degree, health. And you're describing joy, which is a health mechanism, you know, uh, and then the the nourishment you get from laboring. I think um, I was thinking about it as I was doing some research earlier. You know, when you got to mass produce a lot of different things and we don't get there, <clears throat> it, it can take many of the aspects of joy out of it when it's very much based in capitalism and, and with that overproduction, exploitation of resources from the people to the food to the, definitely the people, you know? So the physical labor that's required when you gotta make it about capitalism versus when you have to, um, when you get to just do it to sustain yourself, your community, your family, your own health, it's a different thing. Um, and, and as we go there and start to shift, I was talking to a person who was in the food industry yesterday. And he mentioned that uh, with African-Americans, we were basically made to hate or dislike agriculture or agribusiness or the farming, the farming aspect, farming and gardening even though it's what we historically did, even in this country for so long, but way before that as well. Um, it was a resource and I didn't share it because um, I couldn't verify the data, but talked about the amount of farms that the black community lost since even the early 1920s with the, the migration, the great migration with um, sharecropping and the horrible business practices of sharecropping. So many people became apathetic to farming, to uh, agribusiness to that degree. And it, it has, we're still dealing with the effects of that to our community. So um, when we get back into it, like many of us are doing, and we start realizing those benefits from just the joy and the uh, the therapeutic aspects of gardening, gardening and farming in agricultural period, it does something to us. So I'm excited to hear that, Ms. Travick. So thank you so much for that. You're so welcome, Chris. Thank you for allowing me to share that with you. Absolutely. So no further ado, guys, it's 1239. So we're a couple minutes into our official organizer circle. Firstly, thank everyone for being here. Um, today's topic, we're dealing with food sovereignty and environmental justice. So as many of us know, this month is a big, is very big. This is our environmental awareness month. This is a month that we start, if, if we're not already, right? Honing in on, paying attention to, and acknowledging the earth we live in the earth we live on, its resources, and how we sustain such. And so what I wanted to do with this specific session, knowing that we focus a lot in March on agriculture and food sovereignty and how we even got there when the discussion initially was food deserts and understanding that what we really wanted to get to was a place where people were doing more to control the food in their own, the food in their own communities. Um, I believe Magneto, is that uh, Mr. Banner? I don't know for sure or not, but if so, if not, uh, um, was involved with, yeah. How you doing brother Banner? Yes, sir. Peace, peace, good afternoon. Good afternoon. So I was about to shout you out because um, Going to the Winston Salem Rise event that you guys have been doing and understanding the aspect that Winston Salem Rise 
looked at sp specifically pertaining to food, I was initially introduced to that term for food sovereignty. And from my understanding, it was one that you helped a group to adopt as a whole too. And so as a, we at MBN have dove deeper into understanding food sovereignty, first I wanted to pay homage to you for introducing that term, not just to Mr. Salem Rasta, but, but to so many people in our community overall. And thank you for the work that you as well do when it comes to the food in the community in Winston Salem. And so um, <clears throat> uh, as we move on, I just wanted to, to, to acknowledge, we, we, we're talking about food sovereignty. We have been talking about food sovereignty. We're looking at environmental justice this month, but the conversation has been so good and we've made so many connections. I felt like I wanted to bridge that gap as we dove into environmental justice to say, hold up. When we look at food, there's so many things we've been learning over the past few weeks that we understand we can't separate food from environment. And so with this specific session, that's one of the things I wanted to hone in on. Let's still highlight food and connect with the people who do food in our community. But also as we shift in next organize a circle in two weeks we'll be focusing more on community organizing around environmental justice issues but as we try to help our communities understand environmental justice more i felt like it was imperative for us to continue with the conversation of food being that we've had such a rich conversation in this area number one and also number two we need to understand that environmental justice is very much dealing with food justice as well. So um, I did have a, a small presentation. I have some resources I want to share. And then I wanted to talk to the audience. I'm expecting a couple more people here. Mr. Banner, uh, I want you to introduce yourself to us. Uh, since I already said your name, I guess you can do that now. And uh, I'll ask you more questions a little later as well, if you don't mind, sir. Indeed. Thank you for uh, the nice words, you know, to uh, introduce me and everything. My name is Michael Banner. Um, of course, on my slide, I got Magneto. That's kind of what I'm officially known as in the community. And um, I am the so-called chief catalyst of island cultures. Um, we, try, we try our best to control our own narratives. So some things that might have historically been called Ex executive director, we might uh, transplant that with another name. And that's what we've done. Um, and, you know, we're basically a community grassroots group that has taken on the, the, the challenge of, you know, addressing this food sovereignty uh, in the community and restoring wealth and value back to the community through agriculture and through you know being good stewards of the land and um you know we also have a group that um that that champions you know the values that come out of island cultures and advocates for those uh, values um goes by the name of brap which is the black and brown radical roots agricultural arts political party and these work in the, as a tandem to uh really uh do our best to put put black people back on the map in Winston Salem because it seems like we've been pushed all the way into the margins and made to be inconsequential. So if no one else, we're gonna kind of like blow our own horn, you know, not out of uh, vainglory, but out of necessity, because you know, as we all know, we're being being kind of like uh, whitewashed and homogenized in the city. So. Thank you for having me here, and um, I'll be on deck to add on as, as needed. Yes, sir. So can you tell me the name of that uh, acronym again? Black and Brown Agricultural Roots Political Party, was that it? Was well, um uh, Radical Roots. Radical Roots. Yeah, Radical Roots. Yes, sir. Black and Brown Agricultural Radical Roots Political Party. And yeah. that's black and brown radical roots agricultural arts 
political party? Agricultural. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Two B's, two R's, two A's, two P's. Yes, sir. Brat. Yes, Black sir. and brown, radical roots, agricultural. What was the other A? Agricultural. Arts. Arts. Excuse now, me. And I'd be amiss if I don't mention Annika Nick, who is like a co-catalyst in that space. Yes, sir. Okay. That's so wonderful. I got to ask you a little bit more about brap later and especially considering uh like i mentioned before part of what we part of where we're going with part two of this is dealing with community and how the community organize around environmental issues so uh i just have a small what we can say presentation it's it's, it's not that big it's only a few slides and really some resources as well. So um, <clears throat> dealing with food sovereignty and environmental justice, again, organize a circle with neighbors for better neighborhoods. One of the things that we wanted to do is define food sovereignty. I looked at a couple of different sources that did that dealt with this specific topic, you know, and historically one source, Humanity in Action mentioned that, you know, a lot of the focus has historically been on food security, which is access to adequate food. But now, as we've mentioned, the conversation has grown to food sovereignty. And, um, it was a lot of resources that I saw that dealt with the distributor or the, the farmer or the business, but I wanted to highlight the definition that specifically dealt with community, community control of production, access, preparation, and distribution of culturally, ecologically relevant food. So culturally and ecologically relevant, um, Throughout this process, for instance, I first organized a circle dealing with food sovereignty. I'm not a big time uh, agricultural person, so I'm learning a lot. And um, understanding the difference between heirloom seeds versus, of course, genetically modified, but even other types of seeds. So what are the types of foods that are native to the place that we live in, that each person lives in. And the, I went to the mountain recently. What's this one down the street? Uh, Pilot Mountain. And we went on a climb and we were talking to one of the park directors and he mentioned plants, something as small as a tree that can be a foreign or in a tree being an invasive species, it blew my mind because I'm like, it's just a tree. That's what most of us would think. But he said the type of bugs that that tree can attract, the type of birds and the type of places in the, and then the way that it can attach to the roots and suck out the life from native habitat. And if certain plants that are natively grown are basically overpowered for, from other plants that are natively grown. It can mean that the animals that are native to this area don't have food sources. I, I just, I was just thrown because I didn't know something as simple as a tree. You just think of regular tree, innocent leaves, not even bearing fruit as in fruit that we eat could be an invasive species to an area. And so even when we look at ecologically relevant food, food in the area, the food that's grown in the area that's native to an area could um, basically help to champion the better growth of that food. And um, of course, depending on how the sun and how the different resources in the environment are available to 
specific plants, they can basically be harvested better. So food security, food sovereignty. Next, I wanted to basically define environmental justice for us as well. And so environmental justice is the fair treatment and meaningful involvement of all people, regardless of race, color, national origin, or income with respect to the development implementation and enforcement of environmental laws, regulations, and policies. And so again, we're dealing with Environmental Justice Month. And so it's definitely fair and right for us to define what environmental justice is if we're saying we want to connect food sovereignty with environmental justice. Let's define both of these things so that we can have a clear picture of what we're talking about. And you might notice I have a, a, a illustration here, and, it's, and it merely states, if you can't read it, environmental justice is our cry of defiance against the onslaught of oppressive toxins and toxic oppressions that threaten to submerge our homes. And so uh, lastly, it's a couple of resources I wanted to point us to. I'm going to put them in the chat. Uh, three different articles, one that dealt with food sovereignty and how it can advance racial equity and climate resilience. And so um, with that, this is coming from the Urban Institute. I share the link in the chat. I'll share all three and then we can start opening the conversation. So food sovereignty and how it can advance racial equity and climate resilience. One of the things that it highlight, climate change, the stealing and exploitation of land for growing food and how that's intertwined with racism and how you address these issues. Many of us might not correlate the, the idea of environmental justice to agriculture. And so this, this next resource that I'm sharing, I want to read the poem that they have here. And it's merely uh, from... LPE, the LPE project, building local food pathways, food sovereignty and climate justice. So in this um, poem that was written, it merely states, in the fluorescent void of the grocery store, we examined the bunches of collards, the bags of okra, grown in Honduras, grown in California. Do they eat okra in Honduras? Do they eat collards in California? We double check the price. They must have flown them over first class. That must mean that the price is high. The markets, the farmer's market, the locally grown section, the organic superstore, they're all worse. And so, again, focusing on industrial agriculture, when we go to the grocery store, we're, when we're buying our food from grocers, they have to go through the process. They're looking for the easiest ways to produce, the cheapest ways to produce. Many times that means that these grocery stores are going to, these groceries or these, these companies, these corporations, they are going to agribusiness. They're going to the places where they can produce this product the cheapest. Many times that's minority workers in countries where they don't get paid a lot of money. So if I can grow this here in Honduras for very cheap, the people who are exploited, send it somewhere else to be processed and then bring it to America, the price that you're gonna get for that product is gonna be also tying in the fact that I grew it over there and I shipped it twice. If you get a banana from Honduras and it's been through that process, you gotta wonder why is it still yellow after about a week or two. And so 
then we start talking about the pesticides and everything associated with food. So with no further ado, I do want us to have a little bit more of a discussion. Now, I did invite a couple different people to talk about some of the things that they're doing in their community. I know I have Miss uh, Miss Mary Ford for a little a little bit of a time to talk to us about Boston Thurman and the different gardens and process for gardens that they're doing in their community. Um, and again, Mr. Banner is here with us. So Mr. Banner, I did wanna ask you a couple questions as well. As you introduce BRAP to us and I'm just, and a couple of more people, Ms. Dixon, Crystal Dixon, how are you doing today as well, ma'am? I'm doing great, how are you? I'm doing very wonderful. So it's a, it's a pleasure to have you on with us, Ms. Dixon. And Ms. Dixon, uh, I also am excited because I know you'll be with us uh, Thursday. I will. I will. Yeah. Neighbors for Better Neighborhoods invited us to come speak from the Greensboro Health Disparities Collaborative. So I'm we're looking forward to that. And I said, I know Christopher Taylor over there. I got to do it. <laughs> so. Yes, ma'am. Absolutely. So I did want to um, ask you a few questions, Ms. Dixon, as I uh, see that you was going to be on with us today. Now, I know with the Health, Health Disparity Collaborative, you guys might not specifically deal with food from my understanding, right? But, it's, right. Still, but it's still health and you're still dealing with environmental justice. So can you help us understand that link between health disparities and environmental justice? Oh, absolutely. Um, thank you for the space. I didn't anticipate taking up space today, but I'm happy to talk. <laughs> um, really quickly, uh, one aspect we can think of maternal and child health. So, you know, where you live matters. Um, the exposures to specific toxins have a direct relate direct outcome on birthing outcomes for black women or more sports, more so black and brown women. I'll also say that also affects our men. Their studies are showing now that men's sperm counts are lower quality because they're having access to air pollution. So if our men can't procreate, cannot deliver sperm, and then our women cannot even hold baby to term, we're not able to procreate. So this is an environmental racism. This is an assault on our exact and actual existence, right? And so that's one connection. Another connection in terms of environmental justice, again, uh, PFAS, which are forever chemicals, those are found on pots and pans, fire extinguishers, things that we keep to keep things nonstick. Those are forever chemicals because they don't break down. And so we're ingesting those in our water supply. We're ingesting those in our food that we're growing in soil that's saturated with them. So if you live near a toxic spewing company like Cancer Alley in Louisiana, you're likely to ingest those chemicals that are being discarded in our backyards. And so obviously that's directly being put in black and brown communities more so than anyone. Not only that, as your property values are going down, your wealth gap is widening. So if you don't have much much wealth, you can't accumulate as much, you know, life expectancy as well. So it's so many different perspectives in that space. Um, we just had a Clean Air NC last year. I'm on the board director for Clean Air NC, but we had an NC Breathe conference last week in Charlotte. And Dr. Mustafa Ali, who was an environmental justice advocate, was in Charlotte talking about the impact of air pollution on our health. So our air is literally directly uh, related to um, um, our life expectancies. Those are a few things, Christopher, I can, I don't wanna take up too much space here in terms of environmental justice. It is a, it is a public health crisis. Uh, your zip code, I often say, is a bigger predictor of your health outcome than your genetic code. So where you live by zip code, there's a difference in 10 years of your life expectancy from one zip code to the next in, uh, across all um, counties. So it's, it's problematic. Um, literally zoning ordinance have a lot to do with this what they approve of what's being built near your house directly affects your air quality and so those are a few things i'll i'll stop there unless you have another specific question i don't want to take too much space here that directly affects health no ma'am i i appreciate you for sharing that with us i know you typically have a class so i wanted to catch you before you left and yeah, um, this, I have, i'm actually free until two o'clock so this worked out today okay wonderful Man, your zip code is a great indicator of your health outcomes. 10 year difference in life expectancy based on zip code. That's right. So uh, yeah, with that, I'm also gonna basically use this as a 
not shameless plug, but plug in our health disparities collaborative that we have established or we're still, you know, growing here in Winston Salem. We'll be meeting this upcoming Thursday at the God, what the name just left me. Winston Salem Foundation. Yes, ma'am. The Winston Salem Foundation. Thursday, I think that's going to be 1030. Um, and so we're excited to have Ms. Dixon from Greensboro, who's also with us through Wake Forest University, to, to basically be one of the people joining us to help us out with our collaborative. As Greensboro has had a, a health disparities collaborative for a long time, and they're doing pretty good. So thank you for joining us, uh, Ms. Dixon, and for supporting Organizing the Circle always. You're welcome, Christopher. And I'll say this, that the collaborative that we have is led by, it was founded by a community member. So this is not a whole bunch of academics coming in there telling everybody what to do. What makes us different is that we're addressing systemic racism in healthcare, and we're actually saving lives because people are mistreated differently based on their color of their skin. So how you present in the healthcare system directly affects whether you live or die. And so we address systemic racism in healthcare, which we'll talk about on Thursday, and how we actually close the gap between black and white breast and lung cancer treatment completion rates. Black folks were not completing their treatment for cancer. We didn't know why. We found out it was cancer. We found out it was systemic racism in the structures of our healthcare system. We closed the gap. So we're going to be talking about that myself and my colleague Lily on Thursday. So thank you so much, Christopher. I look forward to it. Absolutely. So and uh, many of our resident leaders are on now. Y'all probably saw Miss Dixon, uh, of course, at least present and some of the other organizer circles. If you will be at the event, Thursday. That's a brief introduction to her. Wonderful person. I had the privilege of, to meet her at Wake Forest, learning a little bit more about the environmental justice work that they're doing on that campus and excited to have built so much uh, relationship with her so far. And seeing that it's growing in a lot of different areas is exciting. Um, so I'm going to next bring on Miss Mary Ford. And Miss Mary Ford is uh, one of our resident leaders in the Boston Thurman community. Boston Thurman has had a health initiative where they have done a lot in regards to starting gardens and doing a lot of different things when it came to food. So Miss Miss Ford has been very instrumental with that process. And I wanted her to share some of that with us um, as we continue this conversation. Um, yes, Chris, thank you. Um, I can talk briefly about what, what's going on in Boston Thermos as far as trying to get get us residents um, access to um, more healthier foods. So um, I live in the community in Boston Thermos where the, where the media is about 30,000 per household. So depending on the number of people depending on the number of members in your household, um, you you were laying somewhere under the um the um, national poverty level, you know, with that amount of money per year. So so with that being said, um the, the people who live in Boston Thermy, uh, we, we can't get a grocery store to come into our community because, simply because we don't make enough money to to keep the lights on. Um and I and they do not take account of you know, federal funds, things like um, SNAP benefits, um, food stamps, that, that nature. So, so, so therefore, um, you know, Boston Thurman, we, we cannot have a grocery store and it's kind of, and so we're considered like a um, food desert. I know a lot of people don't like that term, but um, food desert meaning that we have to travel so far outside of our community to get access to fresh fruits and vegetables. Okay. So with that being said, there's an initiative that was going around that, you know, we can kind of help, um, help lighten that burden of, um, have, of not having access. We can, you know, you know, try to grow some of our own food, you know, to try to um, pr produce food for, you know, for our families. So um, that's what um, we decided to do. We have two, two community gardens. Um, right now in Boston Thurman and, and hopefully um, that would, you know, th those numbers will continue to grow. But what we learned in the first initial states of, you know, trying to get these gardens up and running is that the, the soil, the 
um, soil was contaminated. You know, so so that became you know problematic when we're trying to grow our um foods in the ground with with contaminated soil. So um so so that's something that that we have to think about. Um, so not soil tested, and and a lot of times. You know, we don't know these things until the soil is moved, until somebody starts to dig and they, and they notice that, you know, the soil is contaminated. In the meantime, you know, it's um, like Ms. Dixon was saying, a lot of us have, um, you know, high increased numbers of certain cancers. Um, and we wonder why, because of the natural element that we've been, you know, breathing, but we did not know that these things was happening until we, you know, move the soil. So that's one thing that um, Boston Thurman is, is dealing with. We, um, I mean, and right now we're just trying to find safe, safe place, places to grow food because of the high contaminated of our soil that's in the community. Yes, ma'am. So hold on, Ms. Mayor, I got two questions. Okay. I see being the person the last couple of years, like I said, I have been more into gardening. And when I first got introduced to the raised bed, it was a little baffling. Like, why you can't just go in the ground? Like you assume that you can. And so you bring up this contaminated soil. And so if it's contaminated in Boston Thurman, I'm going to assume it's contaminated in East Winston. I'm going to assume it's, it, I'm going to assume it's contaminated in South Winston as well. How, how would a person just know that their soil is contaminated? How did you guys in Boston Thurman found out? Like, was it a different color? Did the grass not grow? What were the signs of contamination? Well, um, with anybody starting a, a community garden, the um, you know, they the is to get soil tested. Um, so the North Carolina Corporate Extension, they have these free soil testing kits. And, um, you know, they just ask you to take a sample of soil um, in different parts of the area where you would like to grow food and send it off to Raleigh and let them tell you, um, I mean, and then you would get an analysis of that of the things that's in that soil, um, and you can kind of use that analysis to determine, you know, what, um, you know, things like you were saying, what things would grow naturally or what things would grow the best. I'm, I mean, given that the, the, the soil is good, you know, I mean, it would tell you if it's high in um, nutrients or, um, you know, what things that you need to add to your soil if you want to grow tomatoes. You know, tomatoes, like they soil a little bit more acidic. So it, it kind of can tell you the things that you can add to your soil to, to have the best yield. Um, so we, we, we did a um, soil testing and it came back that um, I think with arsenic, we had high levels of arsenic. And if you think, and, you know, look up, you know, think about it um, over in Shanita's Johnson um, neighborhood with the Haynes School, you know, that whole movement around there where um, it wasn't safe for them kids to be in school, that, you know, that that land was contaminated, you know, like you were saying. And even over at um, where Ashley's school is with the whole mildew things in the school, you know, I'm, you know I, I, I can probably bet you that some of their soil is contaminated as well. Yes, ma'am. So, 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 so initially that was how we found out about you know our soil and having um high levels of arsenic in certain areas and arsenic is a poison correct yes so it's, I know um it's I, I think it's a gas um i'm not sure i i didn't i, I gotta go back to my chemistry but the um the boston thurman was you know, they had a lot of houses to have those oil, those big oil tanks to use to heat our homes. 
So it said that's where the contamination came from. Wow. Uh, uh, of how we used to heat our homes, you know. Yes, ma'am. And how some people still use those oil tanks, to, you know, to heat their homes. I got one of those. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, um, yeah. no, at my home, which I bought an older home, it was one and it was in the ground and the insurance was way higher because we had one and it was in the ground. So we, we switched our heat and source, uh, but it, a lot of insurance companies didn't want to give us home insurance because of the in the ground oil tank. And so it was, it took a while for us to close because of that simple process. And so when we did revitalization in our community, they tested soils at a bunch of different houses in our community. And um, I think one of the things, well, they, they tested my soil and it wasn't the best. And a person was telling us, you can tell if you have grubs in your, in your yard, that's a sign. I was like, grubs is a sign of bad soil? I thought that was just natural bugs so yeah if you see those that means that that's a sign that you don't have good soil so um that's that's very interesting and we're not thinking about if it's arsenic in the soil even if you don't plant anything if flowers grow and they pollinate are those flowers still contaminated that, so the pollen that we breathe in every day is that pollen also contaminated in a way where it's affecting our system and causing us to have even more issues. Thank you for that, Miss Mary. Uh, if you if, if you want to continue, please go. Uh, man, I mean, you just gave me some stuff to think about. <laughs> You're welcome. Thank you, Miss Miss Travick. I see you got your hand raised. No. Okay. Um. All right. All right. <clears throat> so. Um, I'm sorry. That was a mistake. I'm sorry. No mistake. I was trying to go to the chat. We chat. I'm sorry. Mistake. But. Yes, ma'am. And so Miss Dixon put in the chat. Uh, Bingham Park in Greensboro raised the issue of contamination of the soil in the park. This park was built over an old landfill that was full of toxins. Under Jose Williams' leadership, they since organized to have it cleaned up. And so um, with that, I'm going to mention two things. Number one, I remember Ms. Veronica bidding, uh, mentioning to us the dry cleaning services that was historically located off of uh, Winston-Salem State's Bowman Gray Stadium. And the uh, chemicals that still exist Maybe she made it underground because of that. Uh, it'll come to me in a second, but how they're still present and how that could potentially have led to a lot of cancer that a lot of people in our communities have been having. So, Mr. Banner, if uh, you would come back with us, I want you to help us understand as we as we understand agriculture, as we understand becoming more food sovereign and taking more control and controlling more of the narrative of food. And even when we think about what's this BRAP and the Black and Brown Agriculture Arts Radical Roots Political Party, um, how do we get an organization? How do we start? Or first, what are your comments and thoughts on food, so food sovereignty in the environment? And then nextly, can you can you help us understand how we can start organizing around such an imperative issue? Um, I think firstly, like sovereignty is a, a dialectical, it's a it's a conversation. Um, it's not a hard set uh, rule to like you know a certain standard that is uh, sovereign. It's all depending on your understanding. And of course, your understanding is the best understanding. Um, so, you know, things that make up our sovereignty is just 
uh, I was looking at a at a at a at a degree earlier that was saying, um, uh, why does he fear now? Because we taught him to eat the wrong foods. You know what I mean? And basically, you know, you know, food food is beyond just the edibles that we digest, but it's the thought process. It's it's what we are allowed to, you know. Uh, coming to our constitution of our bodies and our minds and our souls yes, sir. And, and, and take on uh, things outside of ourselves. So, you know, just trying to stay as close to uh, native with ourselves, um, you know, uh, being able to grow things like greens, uh, black eyed peas, um, okra, you know, eating food from the, from, close to the homeland of Africa or, you know, from the Southern hemisphere. Some of these things are things that can help nourish our, nourish us at a cellular level and really help restore some of these thoughts. So I found it to be kind of like counterproductive to even try to speak on certain terms with people before they kind of have kind of cleaned themselves up, uh, you know, food wise. A lot of times, you know, uh, sovereignty can be confused to be, you know, you know, our our proximity to a grocery store, or you know, our ability to, um, you know, run a food stamp card. But in my mind, I think you know, sovereignty is more like being able to, like you say, uh, control how you know our culture is you know played through our lives you know the narrative that we hold and being able to um you know sustain ourselves and you know of course we can't grow with a certain portion of what we eat every day so a lot of it comes through our collaborations our our organizing with people outside of the city outside the state you know even sometimes outside of the continent and being able to continue that rapport until it um, becomes, you know, our culture, our way of life. So I don't know if I answered your question, but yes. um, you said basically like as far as organizing. Yeah. So um, with Brap, what what steps are y'all taking? How? Yeah. What steps are y'all taking in this in these areas? With Brap, you know, I would say that Brap, you know, of course, one of our mantras is free the land. So. You know, there's no food sovereignty without land sovereignty. So that's that's where we've been more geared towards, you know, freeing up the land by all means necessary. Uh, some of it has come through raising funds to, to purchase property. Some of it has come through, you know, building relationships and being able to lease or, you know, just getting rights over property, exercising uh, the ordinance in the city, um, which is UDO 283, if I'm mistaken. Uh, the agricultural ordinance, um, the urban agricultural ordinance. And um, that allows for you to grow a lot, take a lot that is in your community that might be a, a breeding ground for being dumped on or trash and take that lot and draw out a site plan for it with um, agriculture as a theme and submit that site plan to the planning department downtown in, in um, in uh, the Bryce Stewart building. And uh, if that plan is is approved, then I think it's still $20. You pay $20 downstairs to uh, get the rights to grow on that property for a year. Of course, that ain't a perfect uh, plan or perfect solution, you know, only getting one year. And you know what I'm saying? There's certain things that need to be tweaked within this uh, city, city ordinance, but the more that people are gravitating to this cause, you know, the more people we get showing up saying, yeah, we we need we need perpetual uh stewardship over this property, you know, not a year at a time. We need, you know, sovereign rights over some of our community spaces that are being greatly underused. You know, we need more culturally relevant food on the on the aisles of our grocery stores. There's different things we can start advocating for politically. That's that's what BRAP, BRAP is about, you know, just uh, continuing that political activism by all means necessary. Sometimes it doesn't look just like agriculture, but 
a lot of times it does land right there. Yes, sir. I wasn't familiar with UDL 283. Thank you for sharing that information with me. And I believe it brings us back. See, I always say when you when you do any type of community work, it brings you right back to what we call civic engagement. Because if you engage with your community, eventually you're going to be engaged with government in some somehow, some way, if you're under a governing body. And so nonetheless, uh I remember when I first uh, rented a house right out of Winston Salem State, and I got a, a, a note on my door for a fine because our grass is too long, and we, we didn't cut the grass. And so when we talk about ordinances, you know, certain ordinances talk about how high we can say the vegetation, because they use the term vegetation even if they're just talking about grass, how high the vegetation is in our in our front yards or uh, viewable yards. The, are you aware of ordinances that do or don't allow for people to grow crops, fresh foods, vegetables in their own yard because of, let's say, uh, it could be violating ordinance? So could we just grow crops in our yard if we want to without in improving city fines, et cetera? Yes, that's a great question. Uh, that's that's um, it is permissible. You can grow food in your yard. You know, I grow food in my front and backyard. Um, I hadn't had any uh, pushback from the city, but you know, if you are, you know, if you grow in a way that's uh, attracting a lot of rodents, or you know, what I'm saying if it's like rotten food, or you know, uh, vines crawling all over the sidewalk you know, they could cite you for being a nuisance. But um, as long as you manage your space, you should you should be good to go. But um, I would say that even towards that end, like you were saying with the grass and everything, we had proposed to the city back in 2015, if I'm mistaken, to have a, um, uh, we, we try to implement a organic land management protocol, which we had uh, paid for, you know, we had, being sponsored through a group on the West Coast. And, um, you know, they've already implemented this in Asheville, in Denver, a couple of more progressive cities, I think maybe Seattle. And we're going to do that here in um, two sites, uh, in Brushy Fort Park and at um, East Island Park, two parks that we've been like wielding a lot of influence in, you know, really putting a lot of energy in trying to keep the gates open and, you know, keep it managed and uh, recreational. And, you know, the whole city staff and everybody, they was like, they were really encouraged about it. They were really excited about, you know, this organic land management protocol, which is basically um, a protocol that prohibits the use of herbicides and pesticides in the, uh, in the park or in um, public spaces. And that's would allow for the pollinators and the uh, the beneficials to be restored. Of course, we know like over 75% of our foods is like pollinated through the bees and the different pollinators. So when we go down that spray for mosquitoes or um, you know, uh, little bugs or whatever. Um, we're also killing killing off a lot of good bugs. So um, and sometimes it's just a matter of like people want that good green plush uh, lawn look and um, they spray, spray the grass to kill off all the weeds and stuff. But what they're calling weeds are actually a lot of times herbs, you know, a lot of times, you know, they're, they're beneficial plants uh, that, that could be used by us, but they've been deemed to be undesirable. And it's killing off a lot of a lot of great stuff that we could use. So we propose this um this this protocol that doesn't call for the green plush lawns, that does call for more uh dandelions and purslane, different, different uh plants to grow. And you know, not the same management system what the city does, you know, as far as cutting the lawns and you know what I'm saying on that same time. Uh, 
but they they shot it down. Well, uh, we had a councilwoman who shot it down at the last hour. You know what I'm saying? She said she didn't want the protocol to be implemented just in our parks, the two parks that were identified, but she liked it to be over the whole city. And I think that's a good case of um, where food sovereignty or land sovereignty took a loss because this is where the community came and said, we want our space to be used for growing food. We want to do it in a responsible way. We don't want to skip any steps. Just like Kimberly Boston, uh, when when they you know built the hydroponics and you know what I'm saying they were talking about putting the gardens out there in that space, and then they did the you know they they started building first. Then they said, well, let's test the soil and stuff. You know what I'm saying? When they tested the soil, they came to find out it was a lot of lot of lot of contamination in the soil. Then they had to backtrack, and it took it took them on a loop instead of being able to go in a one progressive uh, flow. And that's what we were trying not to do. You know what I'm saying? We were trying to go about remediating all the soil first. You know what I'm saying? And then, you know, stepping into that uh, space where we could be growing food responsibly for the community. So just think that's a, um, something that we should be aware of, you know, lend more of an ear to the community and allow the community to raise the, the the issues and the priorities for the governance and then let the governance work out the will of the people. Yes, sir. So how long ago was this, uh, the organic land management protocol shot down? Like, so is there still momentum for, let's say resident leaders or more people to get involved to if this councilwoman shot it down and she mentioned having it in the more parks, what do we got to do to make this thing happen? Well, as I've as I've been paying attention and I found out um, in many cases with the city, uh, a lot of a lot of ideas get co-opted, you know, through the community back to the city, and you know, it came back to me sitting at a um, Piedmont Environmental Alliance. A round table. Um, and I'm pretty sure you will be there probably at this upcoming round table. Might be an issue you want to, you know, you or somebody at NBN want to bring up. But you know, basically um the city, I had I had the uh, city manager sitting at my table. He was like, you know, we were getting doing our icebreakers and getting to know each other. Then it was like, what's something progressive that you would like to see in the community? And um you know, this uh, city manager, he started raving to me about the um, organic land management protocol and didn't realize that, you know, I am, you know, pretty much the one who brought that to the city, you know, fully funded, fully sponsored, two spaces that had been curated, ready to go. And, um, you know, that was only, you know, that was, that was stopped. So I was like, so he's like, yeah, so this is um what we plan on doing at the city in all of our parks, you know, or some parks that have been identified. So I was like, um, well, you do realize, you know, you know, you know, the narrative on that. And um, so basically they the city has been talking about this for over like probably six years now, way before COVID. And um they're talking about implementing it in the parks, but they've had to go back to our own partners uh, beyond pesticides, toxic free North Carolina. These are like people we work with. And of course they're gonna point them right back to us. Like, well, did you not speak to the community group Island Cultures? Um, Cause you know, people don't really respect when, you know, when, 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 when people like opportune themselves and leapfrog over you know, people's work, you know what I'm saying? So um, I'm sure they've gotten some information from those groups, uh, but it's been greatly stagnated. You know, I think that, you know, what they have a couple hours a month to do, but what we've devoted so much time to do, it pales in comparison, you know? So it would have happened a lot sooner on a community level, but by going through the bureaucracy of the city, it's um is is really been going slow. So I would be open to uh you know a discussion and you know maybe a budding alliance that you know maybe us because I've seen that where you all have partnered with PEA as well. You know what I'm saying? Um we've had these conversations with PEA. They've 
they've definitely co co you know coalesced with our efforts and um you know aligned themselves with our efforts. So if you want, you know, I, I would love to have that communication or that conversation about how we can build some type of uh juggernaut, you know what I'm saying, to say, okay, this is what we're gonna do and um try to, you know, try to understand understand that protocol a little more and how we can implement it in our communities. Yes, sir. Absolutely. And uh, for those of you who don't know, PEA is the Piedmont Environmental Alliance. <clears throat> and um, we mentioned even on our last two organizer circles, we had the, we're working with them in addition to the Yak and River Keeper with the uh, Brush Street, Brushy Creek, Brushy Fork Creek, right? Brushy Fork. Yeah, with the, the 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 erosion that's coming from the airport and uh, basically causing issues in a lot of the communities right off of Carver School Road. And so um, with that, it's just showing us time and time again, gradually, how many of these issues, they are holistic issues there. It is environment. It is in the environment end up being a civic issue. And if you really want to deal with it, you're, you're going to have to deal with the civic um, forces, with, whether it's local city council or county, county commissioners, or even the state. And it's interesting just to remain on this side note for a second that the state of North Carolina is trying to de annex the airport. And so when, with doing this work, part of what we, my 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 thought, conspiracy is that oh this has to do with not being uh, held responsible for those communities who basically have been uh, injustified or injusticed through the the erosion issue and and with the erosion what happened was the cutting down of trees led to the exposure of root systems that would help the, the the flow of water and the runoff and now that runoff runoff is causing more and more issues as it's allowed to roam more freely because there are no trees or roots there to help sustain them um so yeah i think and just to stay on the point for a minute with you you know i was uh i tried to talk to you actually at the last uh county commissioner uh meeting we were at um, because I wanted to have you on even on the last two organizer circles. And so um, part of what we're trying to do now, you know, is just to just continue to build communities in all ways possible. You know, it's a lot that we know that I know for sure that has happened in the city, a lot of organizing in a lot of different areas. And so I think even with taking on this position at NBN, I'm not a fool or understand that we don't have to recreate no will. We need to tap into the places with the people who already have been doing, who do do, who are professional, like you said earlier, who have spent years in these areas. And so, as I mentioned, with agriculture, even with gardening, we got a little bit in my backyard, but I am no uh, master gardener. But we have organized and connected with master gardeners. And now I'm going to assume you definitely are a master gardener as well. So I commend you again for all the work that you do in the community brother uh, banner. And so um, I look forward to your point too, working more with you and growing the alliance as we work collectively with PEA and everyone else to, you know, do this work that's necessary in the community. It just brings it back. It's a food thing, but you can't get deeply into food without eventually starting to understand environment. I think within this conversation, <laughs> that point that point has just kept coming back. When you start trying to grow a garden and you realize the soil is contaminated and, and even poisonous, it's like, hold up. But we would not have thought about some of these things if we did not start gardening. So it's a it's a wonderful thing that Happy Hill did take the initiative to say, let's do something civic, civic responsibility. Let's do something ourselves about 
our lack of food issues, our food desert. Let's help ourselves to be food more sustainable or more sovereign. And once they started doing that, they ran directly into an environmental issue. So again, then we start learning. When we see, when we see raised beds, we start learning. Once you turn into food, you start learning way, way more, especially if you care, especially if you got taste buds and you can taste the difference between things that are organically grown versus things that are pesticide grown. When you go to a Whole Foods even versus a food line, as I've mentioned on here before, and smell the difference in the produce sections. And so, of course, when you do it your own self and you got your herdloom seeds and you got your natural plants and things that are native to environments that we care about, you start seeing even more of a difference. And when you grow your own crops and you can eat the food, whether it's cooked or fresh, freshly just eaten, and you play the part in having that food be produced, it's such an empowering thing. That's one of the biggest things I realized, like looking at your crops and we grew this and we about to take this in the house and we're going to eat this. It's like how many of our people don't have that experience just because we've been conditioned to go to the grocery store. <laughs> yes, sir. So thank you. I absolutely look forward to continuing this relationship and uh, we will have uh Hopefully, the plan is to have PEA and Yakin River Keeper, in addition to a couple of other environmental groups, on our next organizing circle. Uh, as we dive deeper into community and environment, and how do we organize around our environmental issues? So, again, the way that diving into gardening, diving into the fact that last year we saw a big increase or decrease rather in a lot of crops being grown. We saw environmental issues happening in California, happening in the Midwest, happening in different countries that disturbed our food market, disturbed uh, uh, an extra rainy um, rain season where, you know, even local farmers, I was talking to Mr. Vernon, he said it was a bad year for crops like tomatoes is a bad year for crops like watermelons last year and if these are things that we're traditionally used to having it's like if you had to depend on them from other people or if you had to depend on them from other states other even a grocery store and they were not there part of it turns back into do we need to be completely dependent on anybody for the food we know we got to eat so do we need to be completely dependent? And so as we get to that independence or that sovereignty, it has brought us a long way. And uh, we were looking to have a couple of other guests on today. But one of the things that we have been, uh, we've been informed about is that the, the growing season this year has started way earlier. As many of you may notice, I mean, I think we all notice, we did not have snow this year, and I'm going to knock on wood. We didn't have snow in Winston Salem this year. Actually, it was like two weeks ago. I looked outside. I could have sworn something was on my car and it looked like snow. Maybe it was ice. I don't know. And it was the middle of uh, March. But in addition to that, we, had, we, we didn't have real winter weather. And so without having real winter weather, it got warmer faster. And so many, um, people who deal with food has told us, hey, the crops are coming in faster this year. And so some of the people that we planned on having on the organizing circle who also deal with food, they're tied up. If they deal with food and they deal with the, one of my guests, food and uh, long, long, long care. What's the other word for long care? Uh, Landscaping. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Johnson. If you're dealing with food and landscaping, I, I grass growing back way faster. I, I typically wait till like the middle of April. 
no, I needed to to get those people win about a week ago. So um, all of these things are happening faster. So that has uh, affected even some of the guests. We we planned on having people from a couple of our uh, co-ops and a couple of our um, food places, different food places that we uh, support and that support us on but they're in the middle of growing season. So that has affected a lot of it. I hear. So with that, do we have any questions, comments, concerns, questions, questions, questions? I hear somebody unmuted. I don't know exactly who it is. Please feel free to join us. And we, we started this conversation. Uh, Miss Gerilyn Travick gave us a, what I'm gonna call a, a, a monologue about working in her garden. And with that, different Northwood estates and different communities with Neighbors for Better Neighborhoods have started or have been traditionally gardening and going through the gardening process. And Miss Travick was sharing with us the joy she gets out of that and the health benefits that her community have been sharing with each other as they have taken on those aspects even more. And so that's been a beautiful thing. Uh, there's so many things that happen when we talk about food and when we talk about health and when we talk about, and when we talk about uh, food, health, and we talk about the environment. How are you doing today, Mr. Robinson? I miss Robinson. Okay. I, have, I have a question, Chris, or just yes. something to like, um, if we can kind of flesh, flesh this out a bit while we're all together. Um, so in order, so we know April is, you know, like Earth Month, Earth Day is next weekend. Um, and there's a lot of, or at least I'm, I guess, whatever algorithms that are following me um, are definitely pushing the, the gardening, um, just as different gardening things and tips and stuff like that. So for those who are on here, um, so far, what has been your experience with community gardening or starting community community gardens? So we talked, like Ms. Chavik shared from Northwood Estates, Mary Ford shared from Boston Thurman um, and the others that are, are on, are you all participating in community gardens or is that something of interest to your, your neighborhoods? Um, I just wonder about that because so far in our conversations about food sovereignty um, and not only here in Organizer Circle, but in others, um, like the one that was at Wake Forest um, a couple of weeks ago, there's a lot of emphasis placed on community gardens or as those being kind of like, um, you get getting your foot in the door with some of these issues. So I'd love to hear from the others who are on the call, like what is their um, perspective or how are, how, how are things looking for community gardens for, for you all? I'm happy to chime in here, Christopher, that's okay, really briefly. Um, thank you for that question. I couldn't catch the name of who was talking. I'm so sorry. Um, I wanna make sure Kristen. I address you by your name. That was Kristen. Kristen, okay. Oh, okay. hey, Kristen, we just connected <laughs> in the chat. Um, you know, honestly, Kristen, because I'm in environmental racism, my scholarship is in the intersection of environmental racism, public health and sustainability. A lot of students, I'm students, a lot of um, community members are really just trying to figure out how to survive and breathe every day. And honestly, I find that community gardens can be kind of a afterthought for those who are in the deep trenches. It's not that they don't care about it. I think it's just a matter of priority in terms of do I have the time to do it? Um, can I breathe? And when am I going to get my next paycheck? So I think a lot of times food garden uh, gardens are great for that specific population that have the time are not as burdened with their environment and actually are have an interest. So I find there's a little bit of a privilege in that space because people don't always have the time to think or care about it. 
<laughs> but for those who do, I think it's absolutely effective and I think it makes an impact on their health. So I find that kind of a tug of war in my experience, me being here at Wake Forest, we absolutely do a lot of composting and all that, but the demographic care is affluent white. You know what I mean? So, but in terms of what they're doing in the community, <laughs> excuse me, I'm not sure that might be obviously a different demographic, but I have found that to be a bit of a conversation worth unpacking more. Um, doesn't mean it's how the community feels, but I ha I get that sentiment. Like I can't talk about sustainability in Mother Earth because it's it's about being green and having green infrastructure. People are not thinking about that. They don't care about that. That has nothing to do with my life expectancy. It does, but not initially. But environmental racism in terms of the air I breathe and the food I eat, absolutely. So that's my perspective. Um, again, I don't want you to walk away feeling like this food security um, gardens are not helpful, but I think there's a, a, a pack of uh, uh, intersected um, oppressed individuals that often just don't have the time or the energy to really actually uh, do that. I Thank appreciate you. that. Thank you. What what it made me think about, and going back to Miss Travick, even um, when she mentioned they were working, and then students came from Carver and started asking to help. Part of it is as we think about organizing more around these things, you know, who were the people who were available to the point Ms. Ms. Travick, I would assume is retired and other members of her community also retired, right? But connecting with students. And so one of the things I mentioned, even helping her do is connect with Carver High School. So, okay, can we get some of those students to volunteer? Some of them did it on their own free will, but we can also organize with the schools to, you know, get some volunteers. Students always need hours. And so with that, we can get some of those same things to other members of the community who are going to be working and who can't think about it as much as everyone else. So I want to keep that in mind. Uh, Mr. Ben, I see you got your hand raised, sir. Yeah, I just want, I want to, my bad. Yeah, I wanted to add on because um, those were great points that the lady just left um, as far as like the privilege that's associated with community gardens. Um, I was kind of trained, I was trained to be a, a community garden mentor, uh, quote, end quote. Um, and it's nothing that I really uh, took a lot of pride in or anything. And I always felt some type of way intuitively like this is that seemed like a good fit for the community and the my earliest reasons was i didn't want to invite any uh colonizers into the community um people coming to the community you know on a feel good vibe uh you know they love to associate themselves with our children you know next thing you know they're saying first they were saying your children now it's our children uh, first, they were saying your community. Now they're saying our community. Um, and, you know, it's this whole uh, altruistic thing about growing just to give it away. You know what I'm saying? When a lot of times the ones who are making time, carving out time just to get out there and grow some food in adverse conditions, we're the ones who already feel it the most. You know what I'm saying? We're already the ones who um, are suffering from these disparities and then you know people are so out of touch a lot of times coming with the community garden science they're saying okay well this could be given away that could be given away so that's what the whole urban farming again I quote end quote uh came out of that in Winston Salem you know that you know we're trying to actually grow an economy you know what I'm saying we're not trying to just grow food to show that we have a green thumb and just give it away but we'd like to see some type of compound interest on the food that comes out of our lots. So, you know, that began, that started or re reinitiated the initiative with, um, you know, the farmer's market, which I always had to hail up the brethren, um, um, uh, uh, Hashim Sali, he's since passed, but he's like one of my, my, my elders that, you know, really got me into growing food. He coined the term who, who feeds you, controls you to me, you know what I'm saying? So, um, yeah, so that's, that's you know, we had to intentionally grow food to sell food. And um, just like my mom always say, you know, 
it ain't all about, you know, just giving somebody a bag lunch or, you know, growing food and giving it away. But, you know, let us make space to build out these markets, you know what I'm saying, and close the loop, you know what I mean? So money is actually, never, you know, this food money doesn't leave our community, doesn't go to the grocery store. It resides right here in, in, in these families. So that's the main thing that I would emphasize as a, a differentiation between community gardens as seen by the cooperative extension. Well, I'm not trying to like stigmatize, but I do like to differentiate that we're not growing food to give it away. You know what I'm saying? We're, we're just trying to scratch out a market and we're not experts at it. And we don't necessarily, it's a psychological thing. We don't necessarily want, um, you know, good meaning white folks to be all in our space telling us what to do. Some things you just have to learn on your own. Like I don't, I don't even claim to be a master gardener. You know, a lot of things I've learned through trial and error and I don't mind doing it like that. I'd rather do it like that than somebody come stand over me with the little, you know, with the voice or whatever, you know, and telling me that I need to uh, do this and check my pH balance and the NPKs come to find out everything that they're teaching out of, out of those spaces is not even coherent with our culture. You know what I'm saying? We don't operate agriculturally out of an NPK or a nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium uh, type of approach. You know what I'm saying? We're more full spectrum. So it's about controlling the narrative. It's about, you know, building the food sovereignty. And um, it's not about, you know what I'm saying, volunteering or sharecropping and giving it away. So that's one small difference. Man, I ain't even, I'm glad you added that term, that last one, sharecropping, because we don't even think about that being ideal for what we do today when we think about gardening. Um, it's a brother I got to link you with, uh, Brother Banner. Uh, you may know him. Um, brother Rex, right off of, uh, he was, he was, again, one of the people who I wanted to have on today. Um, but he's in the middle of the season. So he's swamped with a lot of agricultural based things. Um, but the conversation we were having last night was centered around him even talking to political elected officials about the markets for these schools, specifically like universities. Where do y'all get y'all agriculture from? And so if it's contracts written that you got to produce certain agriculture to schools. They they eat. All the schools have cafeterias. I always thought about this on the high school level, especially in our communities where our students don't get the best resources. One of the things that, um, like I used to share with my students in my civics class was this. In the and when 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 President Obama was in office, right, under First Lady Michelle Obama, who uh, incorporated the Healthy Food Initiatives, right, that completely irritated farmers, the farmers who, and it's like, why would that? Okay, the people who were contracted with the schools to sell milk, to sell chocolate milk, to sell things like uh, that were not healthy. They lost the market if they were selling us pizza, french fries, certain things they had to completely change. And so with that, it affected their market because she made this shift in how we ate food in the school systems. And one of the first things President Trump did when he got back to back in office was try to um, ease some of those policies around him surrounding school food because it was about the farmers who had the contracts for the schools and he was supposed to be uh, big on being in business or being supported by farmers and with that it just tells us how some of the market works as we deal with not just community and civic engagement and environment but understanding the, the food market for growers there is a market that there's already budgets that the, the local school board has to write up. 
that the universities that are local have to write up, that the community colleges that are local have to write up. How do we get into those markets? And so once we start understanding some of those things a little bit more, it's the next step. It's a little bit more sophisticated, but all these people already have quotas that they're supposed to be meeting about supporting certain amounts of businesses, supporting certain percentages of minority or Black businesses, et cetera. And so getting into understanding that process becomes imperative based on what you just said. So thank you. I see Ms. Dixon, uh, you have your hand raised. Yeah, but I, I'm going to hop off for class at two o'clock, but I do want to address what was just shared. I, I'm not sure if your name is Magneto. I'm not sure if that's your last name or first name, but I do want to address what you mentioned mm -hmm. that I appreciate. Sorry, I don't know. I appreciate what you said because you're the first person I've ever heard approach uh, gardening as a tool for economic mobility. It's always been a fish fixing business. No one ever talked about systems thinking and how we can actually take control of our actual wealth. And so I wanted to make sure you hear my heart in that I was pushing back on a system that often used it as a band aid and not an actual economic mobility. So I appreciate the work you're doing because that's exactly what I wish I would hear more people say that's why we're doing gardening, not because they need it really, like you were saying, Christopher, you, you, food lines should have the same food as Harris Teeter and Publix. It shouldn't smell different. And beyond that, if we're growing our own foods in this particular space we're talking about, we need to talk from a perspective of what you just described. I've never heard anyone talk about that. So I, I now my perspective is shifting because I've never heard that. So we need to get your voice out more. <laughs> and obviously Christopher's doing that. And I'm sure you do a host of other talking and speak to other people, but I'm glad to be connected with you on that. So I wanted to make sure I, I um, clarify where my perspective was coming from. Thank you all so much for the space. I, I look forward to seeing you all Thursday. I hope you can make it. Absolutely. Thank you for that, Crystal. I just left my um, comment in there. If you can, um, if you can, if you can reach me at this email, I'd love to continue this conversation with you and um, try to try to bring some fruition out of it. You know what I mean? Yes, yes. I dropped mine there because I don't see yours. Um, okay. Oh, I see I, it. Up. Is it up, Michael? Yes, it is. Oh, I got you. Okay, I got you, Michael. All right. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Have a good one. Thank you. Yes. So. Um, and I, and I believe even as we talk about our health disparities collaborative, food is health. So maybe, uh, Kristen, we need to think about how we incorporate in the space. I don't know. Maybe that's- it, it, sounds, it sounds good to me. I mean, we, funny enough, we talked about this a little bit. I don't remember if um, it was caught when we were discussing, you know, the grassroots grants program and, and everything, but there was a short discussion about, you know, if we're using a micro grant to fund some community gardening, is there a way to make this um, a tool for economic mobility for that neighborhood? So not just growing to give away the produce from that garden, but selling it and using those funds for some other project or things of, of that nature. So um, it's, it's really, it, I mean, it kind of gives me goosebumps, like where, you know, the, these thoughts, these ideas are coming from um, and, and coming together in this space right now. So yeah, that, that that's exciting. Absolutely. Yeah, I think this has been a wonderful session. Um, so it's, it's a pro, we are, we at the two o'clock mark in a minute. I do want to uh, leave the floor open for anyone who has any additional questions, et cetera. And um, in addition to that, uh, I got, I have two more things that I want to share with us. Um, firstly, starting with this resource. So um, last week, I was on my way home from Atlanta. And I was on a flight and, you know, if you catch a Delta, they got the TVs and they got the pre. So they had this uh, gangster gardener and they introduced me to this brother and what he has done, Ron Finley. And uh, I don't know if you guys are familiar with him. I tried to uh, introduce Kristen. Uh, yeah, I talked to Kristen about him for a second because it was a. Uh, it was an interesting story 
And so when we talked about UDL 283, and I mentioned the different things that were happening in the community regarding uh, can you grow things in your front yard, which Mr. Banner answered for us. One of the things that Ryan Finley did, he's in uh, Compton, definitely LA, but I'm thinking Compton specifically. He was growing food in some of the, uh, basically all, just on the corners. And he got fined in South Central, yes. Growing food in the neighborhood parkways. And so he got fined, he stopped and he started doing it again. He got fined again. And then he fought back. And so he started organizing. Now he calls himself the Gangster Gardener. Uh, he has a series out where he got a couple of videos on master gardening, teaching people this, compost, everything. So it was brilliant, but this is his uh, page. I'm going to put that in the chat for everyone to see. I tried to watch it after I got off the airplane and because it was a it was a whole series. My flight wasn't long. I wish I had. That was one time I wish I had a longer flight. <laughs> But um, it was a good series nonetheless. Nextly, and lastly from me, I want to just point us to our NBN newsletter that uh, we as an organization so gracefully, our, our community person puts together a wonder newsletter for us. So just to highlight some of the things that we got coming up, uh, we're already at the 13th. Well, that'll be here soon. Of course, we're at the organizing circles today. Health disparities, collaborative meeting, like we mentioned, that will be happening at the Winston-Salem Foundation, 1030 to 1230, 1030 to 12 o'clock. This upcoming Thursday, we got a grassroots grants public information session that's happening 530 to 7 p.m at the Sockbox, 1650 Ivy Avenue. That's NBN's old location, if you are familiar with NBN's old location. So grassroots grants, if, if you have an organization that's looking for a way to get some funding, especially if you're on in, if you're located in one of our place-based, place, place-based uh, place initiative communities, then come check out our grassroots grants information session. We'll be located at three different events this upcoming Saturday. First, we have the Spring Fling event that's happening at Grace Presbyterian Church that's 10 to 2. We have the Family and Friends Festival that's from 11 to 2 at Bolton Park. And then we have Winston-Salem State's Rooted in Resilience Community Day event that's happening at the Albert H. Anderson Conference Center on Western Salem State's campus from 12 to 4 p.m. Um, we have a bunch of different community members here, but uh, I know Ms. Ms. Travick shared with us, you got the Northwood Estates Community Meeting. We, NBN, will be present there because of the brushy, brushy Fork Creek issue and the erosion that we're teaming up with Northwood Estates, PEA, and Yakin River Keeper to basically see how we can help Northwood Estates community with that issue. That's gonna be from 12 to two. And then Piedmont Environmental Alliance Earth Day, the Saturday after next from nine o'clock to 4 p.m., 9 a.m. to 4 p.m., we'll be at the Winston-Salem Fairgrounds. And that'll be a huge event hosted by PEA and attended by many environmental agencies from around the state, the city, and maybe even the country. Um, so NBN will be present there. We will, we will have a space. And as you can see, based on these conversations and the work we're even doing with Northwood Estates, a lot of our work has been environmentally related. We might not have just looked at it that way. So one of the things we've been talking to PEA is about is basically how a lot of our community economic justice is also environmental justice as well. And we have a REI rooted in, uh, that's not rooted in resilience, REI phase one and phase two training that will be happening on the 24th and 25th of this month. And our follow-up organizer circle from this one where we're organizing the community. How can the community organize around environmental issues? We will go deeper into that on April the 25th at 1230. So grassroots grants information, 
organize a circle, REI, phase one and phase two, the 24th and 25th, excuse me, and then flyers for our different community, community Easter egg hunt, spring fling mentioned, family and friends day mentioned, and lastly, lastly, the Rooted and Resilience Tour at Wissasellum State. And then lastly, it's going to be Earth Day. So, yeah, no further ado, I'm going to stop. Does anyone have any last comments, questions, thoughts, closing points that want to be, that you would like to add? I see we got Mr. Uh, Robinson in the chat. He shared a, he shared a link with us. Long Robinson, New York Times, special series on Black gardeners and the pandemic. Okay, yeah. All right, so go to the gallery. Thank you again, Mr. Banner, for your time, your energy, your effort, what you have contributed to this conversation today. It was very enriching. And I appreciate you so much for your time, sir. And as mentioned, I look forward to collaborating with you. Likewise, this will be quite natural. So yes, let's make that make that happen. Appreciate you putting me on. And um, yeah, look forward to seeing you soon. Absolutely. No further questions. Chris, mm -hmm. you, like you got something to say. I think I'm good. This was a really great conversation. And we hope to see everyone soon. Absolutely. Miss Miss Johnson. Mm -hmm. what, did you, did you, what you say, Miss Johnson? I, I just thank Michael for showing up. I um he's he's very interesting. Every time he comes, he brings a wealth of knowledge. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right, guys. I hope you all have a wonderful rest of the day, wonderful rest of the week. And uh, let's get out here. Let's get some gardening done. If you need some, you need some pointers, Michael Banner put his uh, information in the chat for us. <laughs> and I'll yeah, uh, reach out. Yes, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Oh, yeah. Island Culture. Y'all got a store. Or y'all connected with a store, right? Can you tell us? We're connected with a store. We had a um, plant shop in Auburn Station back in like 2016, 2017, but we're right back here in the community on the island. And um, we have a store called Herbs Bargains that um, we're pretty much, that's our headquarters. So that's 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 where you can easily reach us at 1598 East First Street. I'll put it in the uh, chat. 1598 East First Street. And that the place is talking about the the best hot dogs in the city somewhere. Yeah, yep, it was there. Yep. Yes, sir. All right, I appreciate that. Appreciate you all. Absolutely. 1598 East First Street, Herbs. Thank you, sir. Thank you, everyone, for attending today's Organizer Circle. Look forward to seeing you April the 25th. Thanks, Chris, and thank you, Mr. Michael. Of course, thank y'all. This is great. Yeah. Chris, we gotta do.